Hi, this is Ethan Hine. Welcome to Play With Your Music. In this video, we're going to be talking about the musicians and sound sources in Peter Gabriel's Sledgehammer in somewhat more depth than is really necessary to make a musical structure graph. If you really want to dive deep into this material, uh, there's a link in the video description below to our interview with Kevin Killen and Jerry Murata, which tells you everything you could conceivably want to know about the production of Peter Gabriel's So album. So please check that out. Uh, and before we dive into the musicians themselves, we should talk about two very important behind-the-scenes figures. Uh, Daniel Lanois, who is the producer of So, and the aforementioned Kevin Killen, who is the engineer. Uh, these two guys are responsible for everything that you're hearing. Uh, for the producer, that means the musical content, it means uh, song choices, deciding which take was the best one, instrument choices, arrangement ideas. Uh, the producer might be very hands-on about coming up with, for example, intros, endings, keyboard parts, guitar parts. Uh, Daniel Lanois does himself play the guitar on Sledgehammer, as we'll discuss in a second. The engineer is responsible for the sonic content of the album, for getting all of those sounds that the musicians and the producer are coming up with onto tape or onto hard disk and getting them to sound good. So the engineer might be involved in choosing effects like reverb, delay, compression, EQ, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, just making sure the signal chain is clean and that everything is working how it's supposed to work. Um, and again, if you want to hear Kevin Killen talk about what it is that he actually does, please check out the interview. It's pretty fascinating. Okay. Uh, the next very important figure we're going to be talking about is the drummer, Manu Kache. And I'm introducing the musicians on Sledgehammer in the order in which they would typically be recorded. Uh, they were not actually recorded in this order on So. Um, they were mostly tracked live. Um, the process is very complicated. It doesn't matter. Normally, when you're putting together a rock or pop song, you start with the drums. So here is Manu Kache. Show me around your food cage Cause I will be your honeybee Over uh, Manu Kache is one of the great rock pop session drummers of all time. In addition to playing with Peter Gabriel, he's also played with Sting and quite a few other uh, big names. Look him up on Wikipedia. I'm sure you've got at least one recording that has him playing drums on it. Manu Kache is so good that, in fact, when I was first uh, listening to the song, analytically, I thought that he was a drum machine. Um, and it's only when I went in using the Echo Nest uh, BPM Explorer and saw that the tempo of the song varies a little bit, it's not totally, totally perfect, that I realized, oh, that's actually a human being playing the drums just unbelievably tightly and well. Uh, the other half of the rhythm section is an equally great and legendary session musician, the bassist Tony Levin. So here's Tony. So Tony Levin has a very unusual bass sound in this track, as in many tracks that he plays on. Uh, in this particular instance, he's playing a fretless bass with a pick. And it's almost unheard of to play fretless bass with a pick, but Tony Levin famously is really into that kind of crunchy, crisp attack that you get with a pick. Uh, and actually, later on, he developed this thing called funk fingers, which are these little drumsticks that he tapes onto his fingers, so he's literally drumming on the bass strings for an even more percussive kind of attack. Um, he also gets this otherworldly tone on the bass by running it through an octave harmonizer. All right, next we've got the horn section, which is one of the more distinctive sounds of Sledgehammer. Uh, Peter Gabriel, in writing the song, was originally inspired by the kind of Stax Volt, you know, Memphis horns sound of the 60s on, you know, Otis Redding and Aretha Franklin, people like that. Uh, and what better way to capture that sound than to hire Wayne Jackson, the trumpet player, who played on a lot of those records. So here are the horns. <laughs> So 
So that horn part doesn't sound totally like a classic Stax Volt 60s soul horn part, right? It has a kind of otherworldly uh, synthy texture to it, and that's because uh, Peter is doubling the part with a synthesizer, and we'll talk about that in a sec. All right, next we've got the guitarists. Um, first, we've got David Rhodes, who has been Peter Gabriel's touring guitarist for 30 years or so, uh, and has played on many, if not all, of his solo albums. Um, but Daniel Lanois, the producer, is also playing guitar on the track. Um, and it's a bit difficult to tell that there are two different people playing, because they're both playing exactly the same part, almost, with uh, exactly the same sound in exactly the same stereo location. So my guess is that David Rhodes played this part. And they felt like maybe it just wasn't uh, thick enough, wasn't dense enough, so they had uh, Daniel Lanois just, you know, overdub it, um, playing basically the same thing with the same sound, just to give it a little bit more kind of denseness. Uh, it's interesting to think about the way that the guitars are mixed in this song. They're mixed pretty quietly and definitely in the background, whereas the horns and the keyboards are way out front and are really the dominant uh, foreground element in the mix. Um, and that's what makes this a pop song and not a rock song. In rock and roll, the guitar is the dominant thing, and you know the keyboards are there as kind of a background texture if they're there at all. But in pop, the guitar is really there as a background texture. OK. Uh, Peter Gabriel himself, of course, sang, but also played all of the keyboards on this song. Uh, you can see he's sitting in front of a bank of them right here. Peter Gabriel was a real uh, pioneer of synthesizer use in pop music, which now we take for granted, but wasn't always so common. Um, let's talk about Peter Gabriel singing for a second. Peter Gabriel is a great pop singer, um, but he's not a great technical singer, right? I'm just going to play this clip one more time. So he doesn't quite nail that note, right? Ha! Ah, he, he sort of hits it, but not exactly. And I think that that is part of what gives him his charm as a singer, right? That he, he sounds kind of ordinary. He sounds relatable. He's not like this super chopsy, otherworldly singer. Um, and I think that helps balance out all of the kind of synth textures that he uses and keeps his music sounding human. Uh, all right, so let's talk about some of the specific synths that Peter uses. Um, the song begins with that iconic synthesized flute, the shakuhachi, the Japanese bamboo flute. Uh, it's a sample that was played back on this keyboard, the Fairlight CMI, which stands for Computer Music Instrument. This was a fabulously expensive digital synthesizer. Back in the early 80s, you would have paid, I think, like $25,000 in 1980 dollars for it. Um, so here's the shakuhachi. Now, the irony is that at this point, this kind of digital sampling uh, could be done on any laptop computer with, you know, $100 worth of software quite effortlessly. Um, actually, there are some free tools that do pretty solid sampling. Um, it really took a uh, commitment to be willing to spend that much money on this kind of effect back in the 80s. Uh, a lot of the keyboards on Sledgehammer were played on this analog synth. This is a Sequential Circuits Prophet 5. So that kind of organ sound that you hear throughout the track is the Prophet 5, uh, playing basically just a triangle wave with some other effects on it. Um, it's doubling the horn section at the beginning of the song. Now, 
Now you might wonder why Peter didn't just use a regular old organ uh, instead of a synthesizer. And I think the key difference is this right here. This is the pitch bend wheel. On a synthesizer, you can very easily change the pitch, which Peter does quite often for expressive purposes. Can't do that on an organ. Uh, another device that Peter used is the vocoder. He only uses it in one little section of the song, but it's a pretty uh, distinctive moment. So one of the things that makes Peter Gabriel distinctive as a singer is his use of vocal processing and effects throughout the song. He's doubling himself and you know there's all kinds of chorus and reverb and probably other things on his voice. But in that section he sounds unusually otherworldly, that sledge, sledgehammer. Uh, he gets that effect with this thing, the vocoder. Um, the, the working of the vocoder is very complicated, but the basic idea is that you're controlling the sound of a synthesizer with your voice. Uh, the vocoder is very hip in pop culture right now, especially because of Daft Punk, you know, and that song, uh, we're up all night to get lucky, we're up all night to get lucky, right? That is the sound of a vocoder. So the final sound source that we're going to talk about in Sledgehammer is the backing vocals. Uh, Peter himself does most of them throughout the song, just overdubbed on top of himself. But there are these three backup singers in addition. Uh, they sing one note in the middle of the song. They just say, yeah, in that kind of breakdown. But then they do most of their parts towards the end of the song in that kind of jam that closes it. So I think it's an interesting effect, right? So he's got his lead vocal, I kick the habit, and then he's got his own backing vocal, kick the habit, and then the, uh, these three women going, kick the habit, uh, and a call and response makes for a really satisfyingly complex vocal texture. So there you have it. Those are the sounds of Sledgehammer.